Hello, my name is Sam. And I'm Tonks. And that's Jay in the corner. This is Celluloid Scrutiny. This is our new podcast where we take movies up, hold them under the light, look at them through the lens of the social issues of 2018. I am Sam. I am an amateur uh, filmmaker and screenwriter uh, living in Nottingham, UK. I'm Tonks. I am primarily a writer, writing under Rachel Tonks Hill. Fiction writer, poet, and non-fiction writer. And I also make films with Sam, mostly on the filming and editing side rather than writing and directing. This podcast is essentially a way for us to share our love of movies with each other and with you, the listener. I am a cinephile of sorts. I love movies and I own so many movies and I've seen a lot more movies than Tonks does. Sam is going to force me to watch classic movies, or his definition of classic, and I'm going to look at them with the lens of a person, a woman largely, living in 2018 and going, why aren't there any women in this movie? Where are all the black people? Give me some more queer rap. And you're going to talk crap about budget and facts from behind the scenes. Today's film is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Which is the third movie in the series, following on from Close Encounters of the First Kind and Close Encounters of the Second Kind. It's and, a franchise, dear. And I probably should have watched the first two before watching this one. Now, in actual fact, it is uh, just a standalone movie, um, and it was written and directed by Steven Spielberg. Uh, you may recognise him from such movies as uh, almost everything in the world ever. Uh, <laughs> he's a real up-and-comer, is that Steven Spielberg? I think he's got a great career ahead of him. He's one to watch, for sure. He did Jaws, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going on and on and on. In terms of cast, it starred Richard Dreyfus and... Francois Truffaut and Bob Balaban and Terry Gough. When it was made, um, it cost $20 million, that was its budget, and it brought in $306.1 million. So it did rather well. So that's a decent return on investment. It was good, it, yeah. So what can you make for 20 mil these days? So I mean, you can still make a decent movie for 20 mil, clearly. It's just I don't think you could make like a franchise like a Marvel movie for 20 mil. I yeah. think that has to cost more. You can make a fifth of a Marvel movie. <laughs> Just like, what, like 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 half the first act or something? Yeah, something like that. It's like, I don't know, Tony Stark says, says something sarcastic and insults someone and then the film ends. Yeah, that 20 mil is just to pay Robert Downey Jr. Out in fairness, yeah, actually, that's about what he even brings in. So this film came out in uh, 1977. So some things to know about 1977. This is right towards the end of what's known as the New Hollywood era. So you had all the golden age of Hollywood um, with the big mega stars and everything, and that started petering out when television became a, a thing in people's homes. And studios lost touch with the disaffected youth of America, and the movies that they were making, they weren't drawing in the young, the young crowd, the youth crowd, youth. and the youths with the hoodies. No, no, this and is ringtones. It's pre hoodies and ringtones. Uh, it's with their uh, denim and their motorbikes, which are still in, you know, in, in certain circles. But yeah, so they started giving money to young directors, and this is a director-driven period. And directors were setting up their own mini studios and their own production companies. And you had, for example, your Dennis Hoppers. Dennis Hopper, not just an actor, uh, directed Easy Rider, it was the '60s counterculture movie. And from there. You had your Martin Scorsese's, your Francis Ford Coppola's. Some small uh, filmmaker called George Lucas with his, you know... Oh yeah, he made a really low-budget um, indie film called... It never really went what anywhere. I think it was a Star War, something like that. Yeah, and it didn't do very well. It's worth digging it up. If you can find a copy out there, it, it's mega rare. You won't have heard of it, but if you can find a copy out there, it, it's, do that. It, it's worth a watch to see what these young filmmakers were doing with their, their budgets. and Not at all revolutionising the film industry as we know it. No, that's what they did. They revolutionised you know, the industry. And George Lucas, he set up Industrial Light and Magic to, to be able to make the effects in Star Wars. And now they're this huge powerhouse of special effects. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah, they are. I've not actually looked and seen if they've gone uh, been subsumed by something else, actually. No, I'm quite fond of looking at the, the credits. And yeah, Industrial Light and Magic are one of the big 
uh, fancy houses for for Hollywood to go to if you, you need good. the normal thing. It's like it's like them and Weta Digital at the moment. I was going to say Weta haven't uh, you know run them out of town. No, this this area, New Hollywood, lasted from the mid '60s, from Easy Rider and The Graduate, through the '70s, Apocalypse Now, Taxi Driver, all the way up to the very early '80s, and that's when these movies started flopping. And when they started flopping, it's because, again, out of touch with the youth. So, so we've got Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I had never seen before. Nope. Uh, what it is, is it's an alien visitation movie. Before we had you know, alien invasions. No. Casually destroying 15 large American monuments during the course of the movie. Yeah, and the 50s B-movies, you know, you know, it came from outer space and all of that. But the 70s, I think there was a need for something a bit more hopeful, a bit more optimistic. Probably because Vietnam. Because a lot of things in the 70s happened because of Vietnam. If you want to know more, by the way, about the New Hollywood era, check out Peter Biskin's book, Easy Riders Raging Bulls. It's a really, really good book, and it just covers the whole thing really in depth. So Close Encounters. What was the plot of Close Encounters? It was kind of difficult to tell at certain points. Uh, <laughs> it it kind of starts out meandery and you're not really sure what's going on and at the beginning it was kind of about a bunch of white dudes I didn't care about. It sets up this mystery like planes are reappearing that disappeared mm. in, in, in the Second World War. There's a massive ship in the middle of the desert. You've got unidentified flying objects mm -hmm. and then they hone it down and actually start telling a story around a character. And like the two kind of protagonists, one is a single mum whose three-year-old gets kid uh, abducted by the aliens, and she's trying to get him back. And the other one is a married father of three, I think. The, yeah. These people they see see mysterious lights flying around in the sky, and he's like he's, he's driven slightly mad by the visions he gets after it, and mm. his life falls apart. And he's trying to search about what it means. What does it mean? To, yeah, he, to, he, he's searching for meaning and behind what he's seen and he goes and he sees the aliens and the aliens do stuff and then he, he, the movie ends. So yeah, it's a bad man who becomes obsessed after his alien experience with experiencing it again and finding out why. Why me? What am I experiencing? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I putting small like trees and bushes through the, my kitchen window? Why am I growing hair in unsightly places? Why am I touching myself? Oh no, that's puberty. Sorry, that's puberty. <laughs> that's not close encounters of the third kind. My bad. Yeah, like I say, I've never, I'd never seen this before. It probably like a gaping hole in my 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 childhood nostalgia movies. Overall, I liked it. Like it was kind of slow burn at the beginning, and I got more into it as they actually started telling a story with characters instead of just going, "What is this? Why is this? What?" Yeah, but you kind you've of, got to see the mystery. I actually think that the bit with the planes and stuff is irrelevant if i were editing it and yeah i you know i have done a small amount of, of short film editing i'd actually edit that bit out because i don't think it's necessary now it's interesting you say that because that was actually filmed later that was added in that was added in spielberg after making the movie watched it and was a bit dissatisfied and said i've i've, I've underwritten this there's there's four scenes missing somehow that it was one of the things that got added in the the ship, the bit with the ship was added in, in Mongolia, yeah, in Mongolia, because the big ship from the forties uh, just reappears because that was abducted by the aliens. The insert scene of the screws unscrewing themselves. We'll get to that later. That was added later. What um, was the other thing he added? The other thing was in the same thing as the screws. Um, it was. You know, with the light that was coming down um, the chimney. The chimney, yeah, that that scene. Yeah, those two, like those latter latter two additions in that scene, those were really. Yeah, those the, the the screws and the, the the chimney, yes, because they add to the kind of terrifyingness of that scene, and that bit was fine. But yeah, no, I I would have left it out. I was really kind of underwhelmed by like the mm. first ten minutes or so of the entire movie, and I'm sat here thinking, I'm gonna hate her. Sam's gonna really be pissed off at me because <laughs> I hate this. Yeah, the abduction stuff and the planes and. I, I would have left out because it's like I just started with the scene in the air control tower where they get their first instance of the UFO, which instantly is like the, apart from a few Mexican characters in the unnecessary beginning scene, is the only instance of a person of colour in the entire movie. Like, we have a couple of Mexicans at the beginning, we have a black person with lines. 
in the flight tower and then everybody is white from then on because America in the 70s was like <laughs> nearly 100% white, obviously. Black people weren't invented till 1980. What? No, I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, but yeah, it's like I would have started with that scene and like seeding the, the UFO and then introduced the characters. Yeah. And at the beginning, Neri kind of annoyed me because he's a kind of a dad to begin with. I don't know, he was, he was an ineffectual dad. Like, there was chaos going all around him. And he was, he was, you know, he was trying to connect with his kids, you know. In, in, in he was trying to be one of the, the funny dads. I don't know, the, the whole family dynamic was a bit off. Yeah, I, I don't know, ineffectual sounds like a multi-syllable way of saying that. But, yeah, no, the, that, that was one of the things That's that fair. struck me about the film, was Neri's family dynamic was kind of horrible. And I don't know whether it made me more sympathetic to the character or not. Certainly, as the the film progressed and he'd he'd seen the 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 flying lights and started to get this vision of this this shape in his brain, mm. was kind of behaving really erratically. The wife character was kind of awful, and it's like I am normally like pro female characters mm. in in most circumstances, but her response to anything that Neri said was he she just started shouting and screaming mm, and just shouting yeah it made me really super uncomfortable and shouting at the children as well yeah well he was guilty of that as well i mean like in the, the first scene you see with Neri who is our protagonist that's right who is the character we're supposed what? to be rooting for yeah. he he makes two separate death threats to his children you are inches away from death yes and i'm like yeah. yeah i don't care that this is the 70s i am like massively uncomfortable with any parent in any circumstance leveraging death threats at their kids that opening scene it seeds the pinocchio thing so it's like oh he's childlike wonder and i'm just like this is a goddamn asshole the when you wish upon a star theme that was incorporated into the soundtrack by john williams but i remember it being a bit more present throughout it and i don't know if this is a mandela effect thing or if it is because we watched not the special edition we watched the collector's home edition which added a couple of things but took away some other things mm. including the scene inside the ufo that was at the special edition okay because the studio spielberg is like i want to redo this movie and i want to do it my way because yeah, he and george lucas things. are cut yeah. from the same cloth yeah li- you, well not literally they're not made of cloth but you know <laughs> um yeah he said he said i want to um redo this movie and do a few things to make make it right and they said yes okay but we want you to show the inside of the spaceship because that'll draw people in and he did it but he regretted doing it so mm-hmm. when the edition that we have on dvd came out that that last bit was gone well taken, yeah. i kind of my first impression of neary was that he was he was an asshole and i kind of didn't really get into the film until we had the visual gag when he's in the truck oh, and God, then we yes. get the, the car with the lights and then he the the car comes around and then the lights come up behind him and he gestures for the car to go round him only the, the lights go up vertically because it's up into it, the sky it, 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 it's one of the ships and it's like that was kind of the moment where i actually started enjoying mm. the movie everything before that either i felt was unnecessary mm. or dragged too much or the characters were assholes i think it's one of spielberg's real strengths the way he uses light and shadow and not just like in this one it was literal physical lights you know and, and how they were moving but the way he lights his scenes and he uses the bright beams flashing down creating these really stark shadows like in that particular scene so a woman jillian yes jillian, jillian. her name is jillian her name's jillian you don't find that out until like right at the end of the movie she's just like random woman number four until right at the end when neary kisses her for no adequately explained reason uh, because he he's forced his family into <laughs> away at that point he's forced his family to flee him so we need to retain some sense of oh you know he's uh, approachable he's uh, em- empathizable so yeah you throw that in there like, like it just came out of nowhere and it really really annoyed me because it's like he's got a goddamn family like yeah his wife is behaving kind of reacting really shittily to what's going on with him but he has a family he has a wife and she's yeah she's as far as we're aware she's she's she misses something or other like, there's no sign of husband i don't know we don't know what's happened to her but she's like a single parent whose three-year-old kid has been abducted by aliens 
She's trying to get him back. She, she what? The, why is she kissing him back? Look, there's, sometimes there's, there's no chemistry between them, and it's just unnecessary. We all feel that way. Sometimes you just have to force your family to flee to your to their sister's house in a, in your station wagon, cross the country to Wyoming, and kiss a random lady whose kid has been abducted by aliens. It's just, it's a thing. It happens. Really? It happened to me last week. I'm so angry about like the unnecessary kiss at the end. I've forgotten what you were talking about beforehand. You're talking about lights. Lights, yes. In that scene, the one where we're talking about with the screws and all of it, the kid is welcoming the aliens into his home because he's a tiny child. And you've got these ominous clouds at the beginning and she rushes into the home and starts trying to secure the doors and the exits. And the kid's just running around going, yeah! But the lighting is superb. The orange, the deep orange, and the stark white, and the way it blasts up through that grate. Yeah. And oh, it's it's actually it's a really, really tense scene. And that's something Spielberg does really well, is create tension. Yeah, I mean, that whole scene with the kid getting abducted was, I think the way we both put it while we were watching was, it was fucking uh. terrifying. And, and it was, because mm. doors rattling and she's running around and barring the windows and trying to get mm. the, the grate for the chimney shut. And it, it rang pretty true as well, because you've got this three-year-old who's running around going, yay, aliens, come and play, because well, that actually, is probably exactly how the three-year-old would react. What and he the said, parent is crapping her pants. Yes. What he said was, toys, which to me made no sense. But then I thought, well, maybe it's because the aliens are to him big toys of some kind. But it turns out it's literally because somebody off camera, to make him smile, had pulled out some toys. <laughs> and he goes, toys! Cut. Can we try that again? Maybe? No? No. Nope. Right, all see, right, then. See, I, I, I know he's, he's only a kid, but come on. I didn't know that. And the way I was seeing it's like, well, when that character, uh, Barry, because... It's the 70s and three-year-olds were called Barry in the 70s. I looked down into the angelic cherubic face of my newborn child and I said, yes, you are a Barry. Yeah, when he's introduced, like one of the first things that goes on with the aliens is that all of his his light-up toys, like he's got police car toys and fire engines and things, and And they light up. Also a really creepy monkey with symbols. Why why are those a thing? The traditional one that you see whenever you want to scare the shit out of someone. You, you got the symbol banging monkey with the bug eyes. It's like, why, why? Like in Toy Story 3. See, I was thinking Aladdin. They turned a boo into two one. Yeah, but that was less creepy and less way. creepy. But... but yeah, it's like, so to me, that was reading as it's like there's flashing lights and stuff, and he's just going flashing lights equals toys because he's three, and the parent was kind of, you know, absolutely losing her shit, which seemed like a very natural yeah. adult reaction yeah. to the, the situation. But I mean, the first time we see them, he runs out the house. or No, he doesn't even run. He, he waddles out the house and down the road. At 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. And she's just like, oh, wait, where, where's Bar- Barry? <laughs> Barry! I, I know this is the 70s and it's like rural Ohio. Yes. Was it Ohio? It was Ohio. There was like a very handy that label like... in the bottom corner of the screen oh, that said, Ohio. Ohio. Is Ohio next to Wyoming? I assume they didn't have to go far. I, I, I don't know. Like, possibly. It's in that middle bit that I don't understand. I know this is the 70s in, like, rural Ohio, but it's still, like, your three-year-old child is able to get out the front door and run down the road at 4 a.m. Maybe try running a bit faster? No? Okay? Yeah? One of the things the movie, you think it does it better, it sets up the mystery of what's going on a bit better. Yeah, I think it does. Quite well. And... <sighs> That was kind of one of the frustrations for me, was I think watching this for the first time in 2018, I think, is the year we are currently, and having seen alien movies of various stripes a lot over the years, watching this in 2018 and not in 1977, having seen the movies that this went on to inspire, it Mm. was a frustration of mine that they didn't look at everything and immediately go, aliens. And I think... Well, I mean, they hadn't had a lot of... I mean, Roswell was, what, the 40s? We kind of have a genre savvy, where it's like, if there were, like, mysterious lights running around the sky that I couldn't identify, I would at the very least go, oh, it could be aliens. I might then dismiss the thought, but I wouldn't have, like, the whole, ooh, what is going on? This is mysterious. And it's like, we've had 40-something years of alien movies we've got enough media on the subject that it's like they talk in the flight center about ufos and it's like ufo doesn't Mm. mean unidentified flying object in the common parlance anymore you say ufo and it means 
flying saucer, it means alien spaceship. Watching this for the first time with the weight of that pop culture, it does frustrate me a little bit that there's so much mystery to it. And I kind of had to keep reminding myself that, yeah, no, in 1977, this would have been pretty brand new, pretty yeah. groundbreaking. I mean, the term Close Encounters was actually coined in a book by uh, J. Allen Hynek called The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry. Yes, uh, scientific. Was, it was published in 1972. So this is really recent stuff in 1977, because uh, obviously they'd have made the movie in 76 and stuff as well. Yeah. But this is really recent stuff. So for anybody who's wondering what the Close Encounters are, you've got a Close Encounter of the first kind is seeing uh, the lights or uh, what could be termed as an unidentified flying object uh, up close uh, from about 500 yards away, for instance. Close Encounter 2 is experiencing physical effects from these um, thingies. So for example, crop circles, Neri gets uh, sunburn over half of his face, uh, that is considered Close Encounter of a Second Kind. Close Encounter of the Third Kind, uh, there's a movie in there. Close Encounters of the Third Kind is where aliens are present. And you know, there, there are aliens, and, and they're, they're there. Later on, other people would add to these. And you've got you know the fourth kind, uh, which is a pretty movie. Uh, no, sorry. The fourth kind, which is uh, alien abduction. Uh, so technically, this is Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, because Barry gets abducted. The fifth is direct communication. So, hello, uh, or I'm an alien, uh, okay, that, that's good, please put some clothes on. Um, the sixth is the deaths of any humans or animals as a result of an alien experience. Um, so, so, Independence cattle, Day. Independence Day. Cattle mutilations is, I think, you know. And the seventh, <laughs> the seventh is human-alien hybrids. So, basically, the entirety of the Xbox, a bunch of Xbox. You can see your ex your notes and it say yeah some X file and I'm like yeah. But uh, um, going back to what you were saying about pop culture, I do think the X Files is why. Yeah, like uh, you, you know you know sat here we've got ten plus years of X Files TV and they made some movies. They I did. Think. They made some movies. They made. You know with three? but yeah it's like with you know ten years of X Files TV shows under your belt and you know. Coming after that is like UFO. It means aliens. Like under the weight of that pop culture, I kind of felt it, I kind of had to put some effort into like pretend I was in seventy seven again, um, and it was brand new. I've got to say there, there must be two things that you can't deny were fantastic about the film: the soundtrack. Oh, I mean John Williams. It, it was great. And the visual effects. The visual effects. Yeah. With the possible exception of the clouds, I think that dated uh, a little badly. But the actual spaceships themselves, Douglas Trumbull did an amazing job. I, I they just look so beautiful. Given that it's 40 years old, I don't think the cloud effects have aged as badly as they could have. That's good, okay. Like, uh, in my brain I'm comparing them, there was a similar effect in Independence Day, where the ships are coming through the atmosphere, kind of, oh, really? the atmosphere burn. I don't and there are cloud-ish around them, and just thinking that they've not aged as bad. Is that after they launched the nukes? No, that's as the big ass ships are like. Oh, that's when they down first appear. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And hover over the White House. Yeah. And the Empire State Building, and Trump Tower, if only. Yeah, the physical effects of the even yeah. the, even like they would he, would even they the aliens they, would they have been some digital effects at that point? No, Spielberg did do a trial run on what would have been the first use of them computer generated graphics, but he he didn't like it. he didn't it didn't look real enough, so they used photo effects. Yeah. The aliens you had children. I was gonna say they, they look they, they they looked like children running um, around in suits, fingers. and then the spindly alien guy. But yeah, it's like, he's got a little smile at the end, and he and he does the hand gesture. It's like, Meh, and his little his little little edges of his mouth just like lift up. It's cute, alien. Not like ET. Yeah. ET was a no. ET is cute. I like. No, ET. he isn't. But yeah, he's a throwing head. But yeah, speaking we'll of ET, ET, there there were for me the ET is like kind of like the big Spielberg alien film I saw as a kid. It's like, everyone's big Spielberg like, alien film. I have a lot of nostalgia for that film and. Yeah, there were some obvious comparisons, and there were obvious influences. This came before oh, yeah. E.T. Like, E.T. 77, was... E.T. was 81, 82. Something like that. So there were, uh, like, particularly in the ship design, I could mm -hmm. see 
Yep. The influences, you know, the th- things that they would go on yep. and later use in E.T., which was mm-hmm. nice. And the, the abduction scene itself had a very E.T.-like feel to yeah, it. Yeah, even, even the design of the aliens, you kind of felt like a prototype for E.T. And, yeah, watching third Close Encounters for the first time, you know... No, no, of the third kind. Watching Close Encounters for the first time, I, I couldn't help but look at comparisons to E.T. Mm. And... It could just be nostalgia goggles, but E.T. came off better. Well, I mean, they would have had probably a higher budget. Um, I, I don't think it's budget or effects, things like that. E.T. feels m- more like a more human story to me. E.T. gets right from the beginning. E.T. is about one boy and one alien, and it tells the entire story through that lens. Whereas Close Encounters starts off kind of muddly. You've got these white dudes in the desert and you're, you're not really sure why. And then you've got the scene in the control tower. And then you introduce Barry and his mother and, and Neri. And well, I mean, the way it's supposed to be in Close Encounters is you've got the two parallel threads running. You've got Neri and his family, but you've also got Lacombe, played by Francois Truffaut. I can't, I can't say that. Uh, you've also got Lacombe, played by Francois Truffaut who is a legendary French director uh, in his own right, and his interpreter, Bob Balaban. Uh, I don't remember the character's name, so he's Bob Balaban to me. He's the interpreter who's like, I'm a cartographer. So that I can provide a crucial plot point later. But you've got their journey to to work out the mystery alongside Neri's journey. So it's not like you've got this beginning, and then you've got Neri and those other guys. You forget about them. They keep coming back. Yeah, they do keep coming back, but... I don't know, I think looking at this from like purely a, a story point of view, I think it would have been a better story if it had focused just on Neri and, and Barry and his mother. Like the other characters can come and go, they're fine. They they didn't need the setup. We didn't you, you know, you don't need like Bob Balaban at the beginning going, I'm a cartographer uh, in order for him to just be you know, get the plot point with, with the coordinates later. You know, just going, yeah, before I was an interpreter, which you can tell he is because he's interpreting. He just says, yeah, before I was an interpreter, I, I, I was a cartographer. And for me, you, you didn't need the setup. So you think it feels more natural, or natural enough, rather, just in that scene? Yeah, that felt absolutely fine for me. It's like, even if he hadn't been a cartographer, just be like, yeah, no, I like maps. You know, that's oh, enough. Didn't anybody take geography in school? <laughs> um, I, I did. I, I, I could have told you there was, there was latitude and longitude. I, I, I didn't pay attention to geography in school, so I couldn't tell you what they teach. But, um, yeah, E.T. felt like more human story, but there was a sense with, uh, with Close Encounters that it was far more for the spectacle of it than really trying to tell a story with good rounded characters that you care about and that kind of gets more obvious as you go on because it's like when Neri first encounters the lights there's the two larger ones and the smaller one and they're mm, almost yeah. dancing around the sky and the little orange one that runs along behind it's going, like Wee! unexplained why there is a teeny tiny light running around behind and then especially when the mothership when they finally have the proper mm. encounter at the end with the mothership Oh, God, the, the, the synthesizer. Those long, lingering shots over the mothership and the the bit with the synthesizer yes. where they're, they're communicating and there's the synthesizer notes and the lights going and they're going back and forth. They are much longer scenes than, mm. you know, maybe I would have edited. They, they feel very much about the spectacle. And that, for me, was kind of how I, I, I think Close Encounters was. It's dated in the sense that it, it is making a mystery out of a thing that uh, certainly I have way too much pop culture knowledge to readily accept as a mystery. But yeah, no, it, at the time it was. And it's not a, it's a story about first contact and also it's kind of not. It's a story or it's the spectacle of, you know, alien life coming to Earth and it's the spectacle of the of the mothership landing and the lights and I think that's kind of why it fall, fell down a little bit for me was because it was I mean it was it was gorgeous the soundtrack and the effects everything was so gorgeous beautiful. but it kind of was spectacle almost at the expense of story it's like I enjoyed it but that was kind of ultimately why in my comparison to E.T. E.T. is kind of 
comes out on top. It might interest you to know then um, that it was actually the script was written by Steven Spielberg himself, who's not really known for being a screenwriter. True. And that might that might explain a couple of things for you. Yeah. yeah. That might make you think, oh, yeah, because but... he will have been writing it from the director's eye. So yeah, that might be why it feels spectacle. But okay. yeah, I, ultimately, I found myself enjoying the movie, and I'm glad I've seen yeah. it. I mean, um, it's got some good performances in. It's got a great soundtrack, and it's it's very pretty to watch. It kind of fell down a little bit on the story for me, and I think if it had been written by somebody else who was more invested in the story and more fleshed out characters, and perhaps who hadn't written Neary's wife as a shrieking harridan, there's I a think... lot of that in Far North. There's a lot of that in Far North. Yeah. I think it would have been pretty much a perfect movie had it been stronger on, on story and character. So, modern Hollywood, rebooting everything. Would you want a reboot of this? Uh, if, if they were to reboot it, what would you what would you want to see? From? I'd say I wouldn't want to reboot. Not because it's, it's, it's close enough to my, close to my heart or anything. I think it's a very much a film that's of its time. And I think a reboot would almost certainly not work. And the changes you'd have to make, partly because of the pop culture advancement, would make it not the same mm. movie. Yeah, that makes sense. It would be a completely different. It would be about an alien invasion, for example, or something like that. Yeah, I don't think it could be about the spectacle of it. No, because that that you know that didn't work for me, who is probably fairly close to your average twenty eighteen viewer. That said, I did take one look at Neri and go, if that were rebooted today, he'd be played by Chris Pratt. He did look a bit like that, yeah. But yeah, he would be played by Chris Pratt. Um, he'd be a wisecracker more than them. He'd be a wisecracker. Yeah. The the wife and the family would probably be written exactly the same mm. because modern Hollywood is misogynistic as all hell and hasn't improved a huge amount since the 70s. They would do so much of it with digital effects and I think... Yeah, a lot of it would be. You'd have to get a director in who balanced it because... I would say it's 40 years old and actually the effects have aged pretty well even so beautiful. even considering all of the computer advances they've made it today we'll be looking at it in five years time and going that looks like yeah because um, they they'd rely too much on the CG because it's so cheap yeah comparatively yeah uh, for my money I don't think we need a reboot because we have a perfectly serviceable film already that does the exact same thing and it's called Arrival Arrival was amazing. Arrival is first contact. It's a mystery. It's one character's obsession as well. It's it's not the same movie by any stretch, but it's it's got the same sort of themes. And for me, now that we have Arrival, we don't need a reboot. Yeah, it has the same sort of fit, the, the sense of spectacles. Yeah, I, I, I those, actually those egg, wrong egg shaped ship things. I actually drew the same parallels while watching it and thought this this reminds me a bit of Arrival. And I think we, we should rewatch Arrival and do an episode on Arrival because watching Arrival gave me a massive existential crisis in a way that this failed to. But Arrival also had a, a strong a, female character, not in the strong female character TM sense, but in the fact that she's a strong character who's a woman. I mean, to be fair, yeah, it did have that, but uh, more relevantly to the discussion that we were having, oh. it, it had alien... You know, first contact with aliens in sort of modern age, and people are immediately like taking pictures and putting on Twitter and like Facebooking <laughs> their aunt to go look at this. Which you know, nineteen seventy seven, it's like they were only really just getting used to having like telephones in your house. We'll send a carrier pigeon to the Pentagon. You know, they 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 were still kind of getting used to that being incredibly widespread. So it makes sense. But yeah, Arrival was a film I got on kind of better with uh, as a modern. Viewer. So overall rating? I don't know, what are we what are we rating out of? X out of five somethings. Three out of five devil's towers. Um three and a half. Like, three and a half devil towers. Yeah, three and a half devil towers out of five, I think. I enjoyed it. Bits of it have dated, bits of it just pissed me off wholesale, but overall I enjoyed it. I just wish that we'd gotten to see it in the cinema, because it was re released recently in the cinema. And I booked my tickets, I got super excited, I was psyched, and I was taking Tonks and taking Jane, we were going, and we were going to watch it, and sit, and it was going to wash over us, and the music, and the visual effects, and I would be able to share something that I watched as a child um, with Tonks, which is very important to me, 
and be able to do it in the cinema, as God and Spielberg intended. And I got the day wrong. <laughs> I, I booked the ticket, and I went the day after yeah. the screening, and my heart was broken. Broken. So I'm glad I've, I'm glad I've shared this with you, and I'm glad that you didn't hate it. I do agree with a lot of your points, obviously. And I'm looking forward to um, many more arguments. I do wish we got to see it in the cinema. I think I would have been wowed by the spectacle more in, in the cinema. Yeah. And I'm really sad that you've got your heart broken by that. But I'm glad I've seen it. I don't think it's going to be a film I, I, I rewatch particularly. But I don't regret seeing it. And I don't want to claw those two hours of my life back. So, Okay, so that's it. I've been Sam. I think I'm still Tonks. And Jay's still in the corner. Roll the outro! Episodes and transcripts of Celluloid Scrutiny, as well as more information on your hosts, can be found at celluloidscrutiny.co.uk and on Twitter at celluloidcast. Links to Tonks' novels can be found at racheltonkshill.com, and she is on Twitter at Captain Raz. Sam's films, as well as subtitled versions of the podcast, are on the YouTube channel Splendiferous Productions, and he is on Twitter at Splend. And now the shipping forecast, issued by your hosts, Claude Lacombe and David Lachlan, aka The French Guy and his interpreter. Thank you.